you're all very welcome to tonight's talk, uh, which is called Israel and Palestine, Roots of the Conflict and Prospects for Peace. And of course, this talk will be given by Professor Norman Finkelstein, as you all should know. Uh, my name is Sandy Marshall, and I've been uh, asked by the organizers of tonight's event just to welcome you all here tonight. And I'm very happy to do so. I'm happy to see such a large crowd, see a lot of familiar faces, friends, even some former students, as well as a lot of new faces. That's always encouraging. Um, First of all, uh, Voices of Opposition would like to take the time to thank some of the co-sponsors of this event. Uh, variously, these co-sponsors, groups, and departments um, have shown their support for issues of peace and justice, progressive social change, and the advancement of freedom of speech for people or groups, even for people and groups whose views are unpopular or unpalatable to elite society. The departments and the university who have supported this event have shown their dedication to upholding the integrity of academic freedom and the belief that intellectuals should be judged on the basis of their scholarly rigor, not on whether or not we agree with what they're saying or how they say it. So just to thank these groups, uh, I'm gonna pass it on over to Gabe, who is one of the organizers of tonight's event. Uh, and I'm very honored to list the co-sponsors of this event. <laughs> A UA Muslim Students Association, Tucson Women in Black, Middle East Justice Now, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, the Tucson chapter of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, and the UA Department of History, who we're very pleased to have as a sponsor as well. So, um, thank you, thank you very much. I want to introduce uh, our next speaker, Dr. Maha Nasser, who is a lecturer at the Near Eastern Studies Department here at the University of Arizona. And I admire her work greatly. She's a very careful and thoughtful, thoughtful scholar. And I'm saying this even though she was on my MA thesis committee. Um, <laughs> but I, I did pass, so don't worry, I'm not sucking up. I've already passed that stage. Um, she received her PhD from the University of Chicago, where she worked with Rashid Khalidi. Um, her work there was groundbreaking in that it was looking at uh, Palestinian Israeli identity uh, in the period of 1948 to 67, looking at popular press and the creation of Palestinian identity that is living in the state of Israel. And so she's very knowledgeable about Palestinian and Israeli society. She also teaches an introductory lecture to Islamic thought here at the University of Arizona. So if there's any undergrads in the audience, you should consider taking this lecture. Um, I'm sure the rumors of how difficult it is are greatly exaggerated. Uh, in reality, she's a very, very nice person and a great teacher from all accounts, although I've not had the pleasure of taking any of her undergraduate uh, classes. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Nasser. Thanks. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Norman Finkelstein. Dr. Finkelstein received his PhD in 1988 from the Department of Politics at Princeton University for a thesis on the history of Zionism. Since then, he has written extensively on the history and politics of Israel, Palestine, Zionism, and human rights. He is the author of five widely acclaimed books, four of which have been translated into multiple languages, including Image and Reality in the, of the Israel-Palestine Conflict, the Rise and Fall of Palestine, A Personal Account of the Intifada Years, A Nation on Trial, The Goldhagen Thesis and Historical Truth, and The Holocaust Industry, Reflections on the Exploitation of Jewish Suffering. I was introduced to Dr. Finkelstein's scholarship nearly a year ago, nearly a decade ago rather, when his first book, Image and Reality of the Israel-Palestine Conflict, was assigned in my graduate school course on the historiography of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I was struck then by the passionate tone of the book and his withering critique of Joan Peters' 1984 bestseller from Time Immemorial, which, as Finkelstein documents, turned out to be an outright hoax. Finkelstein considers carefully the work of such prominent Israeli historians as Anita Shapiro and Benny Morris. In particular, he argues that Morris's well-known thesis that the 1948 Palestinian refugee crisis was, quote, born of war and not by design, unquote, is actually undermined by Morris's own painstakingly researched evidence, which shows that Zionist forces actually undertook a more deliberate plan of expulsion than Morris allows. Finkelstein's criticisms of Morris's work, dating back over a decade ago, continue to this day to inform scholarly debates on that crucial period of Israeli and Palestinian history. Finkelstein's most recent book is Beyond Chutzpah, on the Misuse of Antisemitism and the Abuse of History, published by the University of California Press in 2005. Here, Finkelstein makes the provocative argument 
that all too often legitimate criticisms of Israeli policies are mislabeled as anti-Semitism in an attempt to silence dissent. Finkelstein calls into question the popular belief that Palestinians commit the majority of violence in the area, and he examines how such beliefs have emerged. Drawing on a wide array of findings from international Israeli and Palestinian human rights groups, Finkelstein also copiously documents how Israeli policies have led to the systematic abuse of Palestinian human rights. Furthermore, he unpacks the argument that human rights reports criticizing Israel should not be taken seriously because of their alleged bias against Israel, and shows how such arguments are not only unsubstantiated, but end up, as he puts it, quote, poisoning public discourse on human rights, unquote. Finkelstein's book makes a strong case for the need to respect human rights and privilege them as a prerequisite for a just and lasting peace in the Middle East. One of the many ironies surrounding Norma Finkelstein is that a man who has dedicated the better part of two decades to tirelessly deconstructing propagandistic writings about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict often finds himself accused of being too partisan or of not living up to scholarly standards. Given academia's tendency, which I'm well familiar with, its tendency towards writing in a detached manner, the passionate tone with which Finkelstein writes is sometimes mistaken for polemics, and then his arguments are dismissed out of hand. However, a careful examination of his work reveals a scholar who is meticulous about supporting his claims, a scholar who does not play fast and loose with the facts. Perhaps most importantly, Finkelstein challenges us all to think about how seriously we should take the issue of human rights. Do we truly believe in human rights for all? And what should we do to help those who, whose human rights are abused? Finkelstein highlights also the moral responsibility of academics and intellectuals alike to speak for disenfranchised people all over the world, whether in Palestine, Tibet, Myanmar, or even right here at home. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Norman Finkelstein. Uh, well, thank you for having me here this evening. And Tucson's a beautiful place. I always like cities which have only one-story buildings. Uh, <laughs> It's very rare, and you get to see sunlight, and air is entrapped. It's nice coming from New York. Uh, well, thank you all for coming out this evening. I've been doing a lot of traveling the last few days, and I'm more and more encouraged that mainstream people are listening up and hopefully at some point moving from listening to acting and that we can all affect some sort of positive outcome to a 40-year-old uh, terrible situation. The topic I'm going to be speaking about tonight is one which has more and more uh, interested me over the last several years. Namely, if you look at the record, the documentary record of the past, the history, the present, which basically means the human rights record, and the future, which basically means the legal diplomatic record, how to resolve the conflict. If you look at the actual written record as it's been constructed in documents and historians' books, the conflict is not very complicated at all. In fact, it's probably among the least complicated conflicts in the world today. The issues that it raises the legal issues it raises, the political issues it raises, with maybe one or two exceptions, which I'll get to, with maybe one or two exceptions, are not controversial issues in human rights, in international law. Uh, these are not complicated questions. And the obvious uh, question that arises then is, if what I'm saying is true, that this is not a complicated conflict, and it does not raise controversial or contentious issues, then how do you account for all the controversy that swirls around the Israel-Palestine conflict? 
the obvious question that then arises is, if what I'm saying is true, and it's still the burden of the evening for me to demonstrate it, if it's true, then how do you account for all the controversy? And the argument that I'm going to make tonight is that most of the controversy is contrived, it's fabricated, it's artificial. And the purpose of this artificial controversy is to divert attention from and so confusion about what the actual documentary record shows. Let me begin with a fairly simple and straightforward example. In July 2004, the highest judicial body in the world, the International Court of Justice, rendered an advisory opinion, that's the technical language, rendered an advisory opinion on the wall that Israel has been building in the West Bank. The General Assembly asked the International Court of Justice to render an opinion, is the wall legal? And the court determined, as many of you probably know, that the wall was illegal under international law, that Israel had to dismantle the wall and had to pay compensation for the damages wrought. But in fact, that was the least interesting aspect of the High Court's opinion. And let me try to explain why. Most of you in this room, I'm sure, are familiar with that term. It's called the peace process. How many have heard that term? <laughs> OK. Well, some of you have not, so. <laughs> Tucson is further away from the mainstream than I thought. <laughs> In any event, for those of you who have heard the term, there's a subset of that term, uh, the peace process, and it's called the final status, status issues. How many have heard that term? Fine. Oh, good, good, <coughs> knowledgeable people. <clears throat> and the final status issues typically refers to those issues in the Israel-Palestine conflict which are said to be so complicated, so contentious, so controversial, that they have to be put off to the last stage of negotiations. The assumption being that if we try from the get-go to negotiate these questions, the diplomacy is going to break down quickly. So let's leave them for the end. Now it happens by coincidence that the High Court of Justice, the International, uh, 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 the International Court of Justice, in order for it to render its decision on whether the wall was illegal, it had to address most of the final status issues. The final status issues are usually said to be, one, borders. What are the legitimate borders of the state of Israel? And what would be the legitimate borders of a, a Palestinian state? Two, the question of settlement, settlements. What is the legal status of the 460,000 settlers and settlements in, now in the West Bank? Three, the question of East Jerusalem. What is the legal status? Who has the legitimate claim to East Jerusalem? The fourth question, which I'll get to later, is the question, of course, of the refugees. Now, as it happens, for the High Court to render a decision, the International Court of Justice, to render a decision on the legality of the wall, it had to answer those first three questions for reasons which are obvious to everyone in this room. If the wall is passing through within Israel's legal borders, well, obviously, it raises no legal questions. Any country is allowed to build a wall on its border, as Arizonans know well. <laughs> uh, number two. If the settlements that Israel is building are legal, then obviously a wall that abuts the settlements will be legal. 
And if Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, is Israeli territory, then obviously you can build a wall through Jerusalem to incorporate the settlements in Jerusalem. So they had to answer all three of the four main final status questions. How did they answer those allegedly contentious, controversial questions? Let's see. Number one, the question of borders. It is said that the West Bank and formerly Gaza, we were told or were often told, these are disputed territories, that uh, the legitimate claims to them have not yet been resolved. If you opened up the New York Times just yesterday, there was an article by Isabel Kirshner, the Times correspondent in, for the occupied territories, and she had a long article about this difficult question of the borders of the prospective Palestinian state. Well, is it a controversial question? Is it difficult? not according to the highest judicial body in the world, there's a basic principle of international law. For those of you who study international law, there's a fancy term, it's called a peremptory norm. Peremptory norm basically means a tenet, a fundamental, fundamental principle of international law. And one of those peremptory norms, fundamental principles, tenets, is that it's inadmissible to acquire territory by war. Some of you who are a little bit older in the room will remember that when, Saudi, uh, when uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait, George Bush Sr., he said that, that this occupation was illegal, that Saddam Hussein's attempted annexation was illegal, and he recited that peremptory norm it's inadmissible to acquire territory by war. For those of you who go back even further or are familiar with UN Resolution 242, the preambular paragraph begins emphasizing the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war. Basic principle of international law. Well, how did Israel acquire the West Bank and Gaza? It acquired them in the course of a war, in the course of the June 1967 war. Therefore, under international law, Israel has no title to any of the West Bank or Gaza. Why? Because they were acquired in a war. And the, high, the International Court of Justice throughout its advisory opinion, refers to the West Bank and Gaza as occupied Palestinian territories, capital O, capital P, capital T. For those of you who read human rights reports, they usually use the abbreviation OPT to refer to the occupied territories. That abbreviation derives from the decision or the opinion of the International Court of Justice. Put simply, there is no dispute whatsoever, says the International Court of Justice, about the status of the whole of the West Bank and the whole of Gaza. Those are occupied Palestinian territories, full stop. Number two, the question of the settlements the 460,000 Jews who have transferred or who have settled uh, now uh, in the West Bank and in the uh, environs of Jerusalem. What is their status under international law? Again, a completely uncontroversial question. The applicable law for the occupied territories is called the Fourth Geneva Convention. And Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention says, it is inadmissible for an occupying power to transfer its population to occupied territory. Therefore, 
the plain language, that's the expression that's used, the plain language of the Geneva Convention says all of the settlements, all of the settlers, all 460,000 are illegally situated in the West Bank. End of story. The, uh, high, the World Court refers to these settlements as, quote, a flagrant violation of international law. Let's take the third question, the question of East Jerusalem. East Jerusalem is often said to be, along with the refugee question, the most contentious issue in this conflict. Is it? Well, Israel says East Jerusalem is, it's, is part of its eternal and undivided capital. That's the Israeli position. But the, in, the International Court of Justice says no. How did Israel acquire East Jerusalem? Exactly the same way as it acquired the West Bank and Gaza in the course of the June 1967 war. As we all know by now, it's inadmissible to acquire territory by war. Israel has zero title to East Jerusalem. The uh, International Court is very <coughs> explicit on this point. They refer to the West Bank, comma, so there'll be no doubt, including East Jerusalem, comma, and the Gaza Strip as occupied Palestinian territory. That was the, the, the finding of the International Court of Justice, the highest judicial body in the world. But that's only half the story yet. Because what's even more remarkable about their finding is how uncontroversial and uncontentious it was for them. Like our own Supreme, like our own court system, by the time a court case reaches to the Supreme Court, it probably means it was a very contentious legal issue. Otherwise, it would have been resolved at a much lower level of the courts. And that's why when it reaches the Supreme Court, decisions by our own Supreme Court are often very close because the issue itself is highly contentious in law. And it's the same principle with the International Court of Justice. For it to reach that level, namely it's going to be adjudicated by the International Court, it's probably a very complicated issue. And if you go through the history of the court rulings, a lot of them are very close. Take one which some of you may be familiar with. In 1996, the Physicians for Human Rights put forth a question to the International Court of Justice. Is the use of nuclear weapons legal under current law? The principle being fairly straightforward, everyone here knows the principle of, is what's called the principle of a distinction. Combatants versus civilians, combatants are a, le a legitimate target, civilians are not a legitimate target. Everyone knows that. And the question arose, well since nuclear weapons by their very nature cannot discriminate between civilians and combatants, then are they a legal weapon? Surprisingly, what would seem to be a fairly straightforward question produced a very split decision in the court. It was seven to seven, and then the, the tie-breaking vote was cast by the president of the court. So even in what would seem to be, as it were, a no-brainer question, it was very close. Now, what happened in the issues that we're looking at? It was very interesting. The vote on what we are told are the most contentious issues in the Israel-Palestine conflict. The vote was 14 to 1. The only negative vote being cast 
by the American judge, Thomas Birkenfeld, to which I'll return in a half moment. <laughs> no, because it's interesting what he had to say himself. These are not, in the court, it was not a close vote. In fact, it was nearly a unanimous vote. Now, in addition, you can point out, usually these court decisions, when you add together what's called the majority opinion, the separate opinion, the dissents, the declarations, when you add it all up, it comes to very hef a hefty volume. One of the good fortunes of being a uh, professor, uh, which everyone here will know who is in that category, is you can get to stay in your office late at night and print out all of this stuff and not have to pay for it. And so uh, I got to print out a lot of uh, high court uh, decision, uh, international court decisions, uh, which alas, I won't be able to do anymore. <laughs> so, um, and they usually come, you know, a thousand pages, 1,200 pages. Believe it or not, they're actually quite interesting reading. They are not boring. A lot of the judges are quite passionate and intelligent and it makes for quite interesting reading. Um, but in this case, the majority opinion, the separate opinion, everything together, you can check yourself, it's, on the, it's posted, it comes to less than 100 pages, the whole thing. Because these are not complicated issues of international law. These are the most basic elementary principles of international law. And it's illustrated further in the case of Mr. Bergenfell. Uh, the American judge, uh, <clears throat> well, you perhaps expect that he would dissent from the court majority, but in fact, he was very careful to qualify his dissent. In the court nomenclature, you can be part of the majority opinion, separate opinion, issue a dissent, or you can issue what's called a declaration which is a mild form of dissent. And Mr. Bergenfeld chose to issue just a declaration, not a dissent. And he begins by saying, there is much in the majority opinion with which I agree. And then he ends by saying that on what is in fact the crucial question namely the question of the settlements. If Israel could not build the settlements, of course there would be a full withdrawal. They are not trying to annex the territory for its scenic view. They evidently want to build settlements and exploit the resources. If the settlements are illegal, it's over. The whole issue of the uh, occupation is over. Well, what did Mr. Bergenthal say? The single negative vote cast by Mr. Bergenthal comes with a major qualification. He says, I agree. The settlements are illegal under international law. There can't be any question that under Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, those settlements are illegal, which means at most, at most, on what we are told are the most controversial questions, the vote was 14 to 1. And on the most, or the most crucial question, the vote was actually 15 to 0. Now I mention that because throughout my remarks I'm going to try to stick only to what is alleged to be the most controversial. So I began with those allegedly controversial final status questions. Now let's try to go through the record, the past, the present, and the future, and apply the same standard. Let's take the toughest questions. There are in the room a smattering of older people. I won't make eye contact with them <laughs> because most of them are from the 60s and haven't yet acknowledged that they are now in their 60s. <laughs> and far be it for me, far be it for me to dispel those illusions. 
And I don't see anything wrong if they continue to wear their love beads to each his or her own. Uh, for those who go back that far, you say up until maybe the uh, mid-1980s, which is roughly when the 1960s ended. Uh, <laughs> for those who've acknowledged they've ended, um, notice the nervous laughter. Uh, <laughs> The most contentious issue in the history of the conflict, in the historical aspect of the conflict, I think everyone will agree, was the question of how did those Palestinians become refugees in 1948? That was the question which was always argued about with great vehemence and passion. Uh, the standard Israeli story was Israel declares its statehood in May 1948. The Arab armies are poised on the borders of the newly created state of Israel. They send these radio transmissions telling the Palestinians to leave, to clear the fields for the invading Arab armies. After the invading, army, invading Arab armies have swept the Jews into the sea, the Palestinian Arabs will be able to return. You could say up until the mid-1980s, that was the dominant explanation of how the Palestinians became refugees, the famous, infamous, notorious Arab radio broadcasts. Beginning in the late 1980s, uh, many scholars, mostly but not entirely Israeli scholars, began to look into this question, the most well-known of them being a fellow by the name of Benny Morris, and the conclusion he reached, along with many other scholars, to quote him, was that what happened in 1948 was an ethnic cleansing. That's his term, not my own, and it's the terminology that's been adopted by many, if not all, uh, the scholars on the topic. Now, it is true that there remains a certain range of controversy on that question, pretty narrow. Some people claim that the Palestinians became, were cleansed in the course of a war. Namely, we all know wars generate refugees. And in the course of this war in 1948, it too generated refugees. As was stated in the introduction, that's the claim. The Palestinians, yes, they were ethnically cleansed, but it was a byproduct of the war. And others say not so, that the Palestinian refugees were systematically, methodically, uh, intentionally expelled from Palestine in 1948. To give you an example of how <coughs> narrow that controversy has become. You take the case of Shlomo Ben Ami, who was Israel's former foreign minister. He happens to be a very smart, in my opinion, a decent person. He's certainly uh, quite honest. Uh, he is a historian by training. A couple of years ago, he wrote a book called Scars of War, Wounds of Peace. And the former foreign minister says, yes, it's true, the Palestinians were uh, ethnically cleansed in 48. But he says, I disagree with the claim that it was just a byproduct of war. The former foreign minister says, no, it's not true. That the expulsion of the Palestinians was based on what he calls the Zionist philosophy of transfer, namely, the Zionist movement wants to create a Jewish state. A Jewish state means a state which is overwhelmingly Jewish in population, demographically. The area where they want to create that Jewish state is overwhelmingly not Jewish. Well, there's only one way to resolve that, as it were, contradiction, and that way is the Zionist philosophy of transfer, namely, you transfer the population out. And so you have an interesting case here of the former foreign minister. He was the foreign minister in 2000. 
under Barack, uh, Ehud Barak's government, the former foreign minister takes the most extreme position critical of Israeli policy. No problem. Uh, aside from the question of how the Palestinians became refugees, the other most salient or prominent historical question that invariably comes up is the question of those wars, these, what seems to be an, interna an, an interminable list of wars between Israel and its Arab neighbors. The 1948 war, the 1956 war, the 67 war, the 68 through 70 canal war, the 73 war, the 82 war, and the usual or the standard depiction is that these were for Israel a wars of no choice. These were existential wars. They had no option. Had they not fought those wars or defended themselves, they would have been destroyed. That's the standard depiction in the media. But it has no relationship whatsoever, whatsoever, to what the scholarly record shows. You take the case of a very smart guy. His name is, for those of you who are taking notes, and more and more I notice people in the audience are taking notes, which actually I'm encouraged by. Certainly they take more notes than my students used to. <laughs> <laughs> um, a fellow named Ze'ev Maoz, Z-E-E-V, and last name M-A-O-Z. And he's the former director of the Jaffe Center for Strategic Studies at Tel Aviv University, which is probably the most uh, prestigious strategic think tank in Israel. And a couple of years, or last year, he came out with this very big fat book called Defending the Holy Land. It's about 800 pages. And what he does in those 800 pages is go through each of those wars, one by one by one by one, to figure out what happened and why. Now, obviously now is not the time to go through in detail what he finds, but it is useful to read his conclusions, which I think accurately reflect his own findings. And his conclusions read as follows. I should um, just mention on a technical point, Maoz is a very smart guy, no question about it. Incidentally, he now teaches at UC Davis in California. Uh, but this particular book is not based on original research. What he does is he simply synthesizes all of the scholarship that's been written on the subject of Israel's wars with its neighbors. So what he's putting forth is the scholarly consensus. What do people agree on? Now listen closely to the conclusions. Number one, on the question of war. Israel's war experience is a story of folly, recklessness, and self-made traps. None, N-O-N-E, none of Israel's wars, with a possible exception of the 1948 War of Independence, none was what Israel refers to as a war of necessity. They were all 67, 73, the Six Day War, the Yom Kippur War, they were all wars of choice or folly. None of them, these are my words now, none of them, according to Mr. Maaz, were wars of self-defense. None with the possible exception of 1948. That's the question of war. Okay, what about the question of peace? Let's hear his conclusion. Israel's decision makers were as reluctant when it came to making peace as they were daring and trigger happy when it came to making war. The official Israeli decision makers typically did not initiate peace overtures. Most of the peace initiatives in the Arab-Israeli conflict came either from the Arab world, from the international community, or from grassroots and informal channels.
When Israel was willing to take risks for peace, these usually paid off. The Arabs generally showed a remarkable tendency for compliance with their treaty obligations. In quite a few cases, it was Israel rather than the Arabs that violated formal and informal agreements. Now, you're often asked the question, if Israel were to sign an agreement with the Arabs or the Palestinians, can you trust the Arab side to keep to the agreement? But a rational question based on the historical record, and that's what a rational question is built upon the historical record, would ask not whether you can trust the Arabs, because as Ma'oz says, they have generally showed a remarkable tendency for compliance with their treaty obligations. The rational question is, can you trust the Israelis? Now that's not rhetorical. That's what a rational person concludes looking at the record. It's Israel that has broken the agreements, not the Arabs. Let's look now at the present. And the present basically means the human rights question. What's going on in the occupied territories? And as everybody knows, when it comes to the Israel-Palestine conflict, there seems to be this kind of complete lack of understanding or clarity about what's going on. So whenever some Palestinians get killed, typically what happens is a reporter writes a dispatch, uh, usually from Jerusalem, in which he or she says that Israel said they were terrorists or uh, engaged in a terrorist attack. The Palestinians say they were civilians. And then the reader is left as the a reporter to throw his or her hands in the air in despair. Who knows who's telling the truth? But nowhere else in the world is that standard used. Everywhere else in the world, reporters do not ask the perpetrators what happened, and they don't ask the victims what happened. Go look anywhere else when they're recording atrocities or you know, in Tibet. They ask the respected human rights organizations, which have a track record for integrity and a track record for accuracy, they ask the human rights organizations what happened. The local representatives of the human rights organizations or the national offices. Now it happens that when you look at the record of the human rights organizations that they've assembled on Israel-Palestine, there's no controversy at all about what's happening there. What do I mean by that? First of all, Israel-Palestine is probably the most heavily monitored area in the world by human rights organizations. The big organizations, Human Rights Watch, uh, Amnesty International, and then a multiple number of local organizations, mostly Israeli, but not entirely, some Palestinian, but mostly Israeli, Physicians for Human Rights in Israel, Public Committee Against Torture in Israel, the best, the most well-known being Beth Selim, the uh, Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories. There is this vast array of human rights organizations. Each of them produces a voluminous record on what's going on there. It would take a normal mortal, that is to say a non-Noam Chomsky, probably <laughs> all of his or her available time just to keep up with the output of these uh, human rights organizations. As it happens, for a book I was writing, uh, I sat down and I went through this mountain of reports from about a 20-year period, 
from the beginning of the first Intifada, 1987, to the present. And it came to literally thousands and thousands of pages of reports. And what was most striking to me reading the reports, come in? No, okay. <laughs> uh, what was most striking to me reading the reports is that, and I could say without fear if you were to put a polygraph to my wrist now, for that 20 year period, thousands of pages of reports from a raft of human rights organizations, I was only able to find literally, this is not hyperbole, one case of one incident on one day in one city where two human rights organizations disagreed about what happened and in fact, what they disagreed on was a trivial aspect of the incident. <laughs> there is no disagreement about what's happening there. There is no controversy at all. Okay, what does that mean in practical terms? Let's take the most widely reported on issue of human rights, namely the issue of terrorism. I don't necessarily think it's the most important, but obviously it's the one that's most prominent in the news. So let's look at it and see what we can find, uh, discover about it. In January 2006, the Palestinians elect the Islamic movement Hamas into, part, into power in which was what was said to be uh, the most uh, transparent democratic election ever held in the Arab world. Not the highest standard, but still, it was uh, a remarkably, uh, apparently a remarkably uh, honest election. Immediately as Hamas is elected into power, Israel, and then followed by the United States, and then followed by the EU, slap these brutal sanctions on the Palestinian people. And the first justification was, Hamas is a terrorist organization, and it has to renounce, renounce terrorism in order to join the uh, you know, civilized world. Uh, as an abstract principle, I don't think it should detain us even for a half minute, I should say even for a half second, about whether or not te uh, terrorism is legal, moral, or the rest. It's not, it's unacceptable, it's immoral, it's illegal, I don't think there's any point in even discussing that issue because if you don't agree with that, then we're in parallel universes and there's nowhere, there's nothing to discuss. We could discuss issues of whether it's humanly understandable, but that's a separate question. It's illegal, it's immoral, end of story. That's not an issue to my thinking. The only issue that arises is the practical issue. That is to say, the application of that general principle. If that principle is applied across the board to all the parties in the conflict, it's obviously a legal and moral principle. But if it's only applied to one side in the conflict, it's not a moral principle. What do we call a principle if it's only applied to you but not to me? A double standard, hip hypocrisy, whatever you want to call it but it's clearly not a moral or legal principle. So let's now take what I understand to be an uncontroversial principle, namely terrorism, which is the targeting of civilians to achieve a political goal. Terrorism is immoral and illegal. Let's apply it across the board, okay? And let's see what we get. Let's take the basic numbers. We start with, as it were, the raw data. Since September 2000, that is since the beginning of the second intifada, September 28th till today, I checked the figures yesterday, 4,717 Palestinians have been killed, 1,045 Israelis have been killed a ratio of between four to five to one uh, of Palestinians to Israelis killed. That's the first level of analysis. 
then you want to disaggregate the numbers. That's the fancy term. We want to separate out combatants from civilians because terrorism is the targeting of civilians to achieve a political goal. If you disaggregate the numbers, separate out civilians from combatants, it still comes to about four to five to one. On both sides, on both sides, about 60% of those killed have been civilians. So at this level of analysis, it would seem that by a factor of about four to five to one, Israel is the main uh, committer of, perpetrator of terrorism in the conflict. However, serious people, thinking people, critical people will object still and say, but wait, isn't there a difference between Palestinians who target Israeli civilians and Israel, which unintentionally kills Palestinian civilians? That's a conventional argument. And my own opinion is we should never snicker or sneer at arguments like that. On the surface, they have a credibility. And so then we have to look at them and try to seriously analyze whether there is any real validity to that claim. There's a, uh, some of you may read the magazine, The New Yorker, uh, and one of and their former correspondent for the Middle East was a fellow named Jeffrey Goldberg. He's now with Atlantic Magazine. Uh, Jeffrey Goldberg, uh, he wrote this book a couple of years ago called Prisoners. It was about his experience. He served in Ansar III, one of the Israeli uh, detention centers for Palestinians during the first intifada. He was a jailer and he was, if you read his book carefully, he was also a torturer, which means, of course, he's perfectly qualified to cover the Middle East for the New Yorker. Uh, and um, at some point, he gets into, in his book, he describes this vehement argument he gets into with somebody from Hamas. And he finally bursts out in frustration. He says, for God's sake, we don't try to kill children. And that's allegedly the difference between Israel and Hamas. When they do it, it's because they're trying. And when we do it, it's an accident. Well, let's begin again with those, that raw data, the numbers. 917 Palestinian children have been killed during the Second Intifada. Uh, that's more than the total number of Israeli civilians killed the total number being 715, of whom 143 were children, which is to say the ratio of Israel Palestinian to Israeli children killed during the Second Intifada is roughly 8 or 9 to 1, 200 more than all of the Israeli civilians killed. So the first conclusion we can reach is that for the want of trying to kill Palestinian children, it would seem that Israelis were awfully good at it. But is it even true that Israel doesn't intentionally kill Palestinian civilians or children? Not according to the human rights organizations. You open up Amnesty International and they write, quote, on many occasions, Israel deliberately targeted nonviolent demonstrators who were overwhelmingly children, deliberately targeted. Let's take a simple example. Of the 37 Palestinian children who were killed in the first month of the Second Intifada, October 2000, of the 37, 20 died from a direct bullet shot to the head. Well, what about those indiscriminate killings? The deliberate killings we'll leave aside for a moment. And let's look at the indiscriminate killings. Under international law, indiscriminate killings are no different than deliberate killings. They both are equally 
heinous and forbidden. What does that mean? Simple. Let me just try to explain. First of all, what's an indiscriminate killing? Let's say this person over there throws a stone at me. And I take my machine gun and start to shoot indiscriminately in, th in the audience, not aiming at her, just firing indiscriminately. Under international law, that's considered the same crime as deliberately targeting a person. Why? Because under the law, you are at, uh, the foreseeable and inevitable, the foreseeable and inevitable consequences of an act count as an intention. The foreseeable and inevitable consequences of an act count as an intention. Now I see these two young men here. They've obviously been assigned to attend this lecture and they're getting exasperated. These, these, uh, this terminology is so abstract, but it really isn't. And I'll just show you. Take, for example, there's probably somebody in this audience, maybe from Judaic studies, who is now becoming so exasperated and frustrated at what I'm saying that he or she can barely contain him or herself. Let's choose a gender. We'll choose he. Uh, he can barely contain himself, and he's now filled with rage, he decides to take out the dagger, rushes up to the front of the room, plunges it into my heart, and of course the extra twist. Um, <laughs> and I am, at least in my opinion, I have been prematurely dispatched to my maker. At that point, the security guards, of which, alas, I see none, uh, <laughs> which is actually irrelevant because I've been dispatched, the, discur the security guard grabs the perpetrator, or what's called the perp, brings him before the judge, and the judge asks him, do you have anything to say in your defense, in extenuation? And the person says that, I wasn't trying to kill Dr. Finkelstein. I was just testing the sharpness of the blade on my dagger. <laughs> well, obviously, judging from your laughter as you grasp the point, that's a ludicrous defense. But why? Because the inevitable and foreseeable consequence of plunging a dagger in my heart is that for better or for worse, I am going to die. And so that counts as an intention. You intended to kill me. Whatever you may claim afterwards, if that's the foreseeable and inevitable consequence, then it counts as a deliberate killing. Where does that leave us with Israel and Palestine? Periodically, you read a story in the newspaper about how Israel indiscriminately fires artillery shells into civilian neighborhoods in Gaza. Well, those indiscriminate firings of artillery shells are under international law. They carry exactly the same burden as a suicide bombing. They are both intentional. Why? Not difficult to figure out.